broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world. And around the world. TV host, best selling author, and radio personality Brad Gilmore brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Great introduction. <laughs> Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripper. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is, is the, the collection. collection. Now, now your host, host the, the Boat. boat. Brad Gilmore. Thank you, Keith, and welcome to The Collection. My name is Brad Gilmore. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome to the show. This is uh, something that I do. This is a podcast with my collection of conversations. Maybe I did it for a radio show. Maybe I just set it up for the podcast itself. Maybe I did it for Back to the Future, the podcast, or for my show, The Hall of Fame with Booker T. But this is um, the podcast where we house all these conversations. Some people collect stamps. I collect conversations. We talk to stars from music, movie, television, comedy, wrestling, sports, and entertainment. And today, speaking of wrestling, we have a former pro wrestler and also an actress, C.J. Perry, that you might know as Lana if you were a WWE fan. She's, of course, married to the Bulgarian brute, Amiro, who wrestles for all elite wrestling. We're here today talking about her appearance in the new season of The Surreal Life on VH1, yes. I just said that. It's happening. It's back. Uh, the Surreal Life is back, and we talked to Lana. She joined stars like Dennis Rodman and Frankie Muniz and Stormy Daniels and a lot of people going on. August Alsina, entanglements. Do any entanglements happen this time on The Surreal Life? I don't know. We're going to find out. I remember when Lana first made her debut over there in NXT with Rusev, which is what his name was at the time, and they were a great package. Great package, man. And... They came over to the main roster. They had that big WrestleMania moment with John Cena. And uh, Lana was kind of the just the valet. And then she's transformed to being more in the ring. And I actually thought Lana had a lot of promise in the ring. And I hope to see her back in the wrestling sphere one day. But we talk about, obviously, her time in WWE. We talk about the surreal life. We talk about her and her buddy Jen Sturger, who's a friend of mine as well. And then, of course, we talk about the time that she actually shot a movie with Bruce Willis. Um which is awesome. You now Bruce Willis is uh, retired, unfortunately, but she uh, she got to share the uh, screen with Mr. Bruce Willis, Die Hard himself. So we talk about all that this time on the collection. So enjoy C.J. Perry, and she joins me right now to talk about the brand new season of The Surreal Life. Yes, it's back on VH1. You can check it out Mondays at nine. PM, 8 p.m. Central Time. One of the stars, the star of the show, CJ Perry, joins me right now. CJ, how are we doing? Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Let's talk about the surreal life. Let's like jump right into it. Because when <laughs> I was growing up watching VH1 religiously, the surreal life was a go to. I mean, Brigitte Nielsen, Flavor Flav, I think Greg Brady was on there. This was the show I would watch. Uh, what about you? Were, you? were you a surreal life fan? Oh my God, I was a huge fan of Surreal Life. And the funny thing is that you mentioned Bridget Nelson. She, how I like became aware of Bridget Nelson was because of Surreal Life. Me too. I would run home to like watch it from school. I was so obsessed. And so it's so funny. Like most people think Rocky Four, and that, you, that's how I became aware of Rocky Four because she was just this brilliant villain, Russian villain, villain in it. But, um, and I pulled so much inspiration from her. Um, as my character on WWE, but um, yeah, it's really cool. It was actually surreal life because, um, is how I first came to know about her. Yeah, it's so weird. I mean, that that same here. I, I that's how she got on my radar, and then you see her like in Rocky Four or Cobra and things like that. And you're like, oh wow, she's I awesome. Know. Um, I know it's crazy. She's did, amazing. Did you like her and Flavor Flav together? That would that was an odd couple, was not. Oh my god, I you know it's so funny because. I just found it so entertaining. Like, I think that the opposites 
the you know just everything about their relationship and it was just so entertaining for me and also I felt like there was something genuine in it as weird as it was like I really felt like in that moment in time they really um shared like love and affection and um I think they just decided to live live it to the most be surreal in that surreal life world you know and it was great television I was highly entertained so Surreal Life coming back, when you get the phone call, I guess walk me through your thought process. Were you all the way in from the jump or did it take a little time to be like, hmm, do I want to do another reality show? I mean, what, what was your thought process? All of the above. That's <laughs> all those things that you just said happened. Um, I actually got a call. It was the day after my time with WWE had finished and I got a call that um, – surreal life wanted me my manager called me and he was like surreal life wants you on the show and um they start filming in mexico city in six weeks i'm like wait excuse me what <laughs> say that one more time <laughs> surreal life as in like richard nelson flavor flame surreal life? <laughs> that's coming back oh my god so i was like super stoked but also um i was shook because i just couldn't believe that you know i would be considered to be a a celebrity put in this house with other celebrities you know there's just so many I, I was so honored and um like I wanted to call my mom and be like mom I'm a celebrity um <laughs> but uh, I think more it was um I did right after all the initial like excitement then I was like I don't know if I want to do a reality show again um because you know there's pros and cons to everything sure. and you know you just don't know you're 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 put not only is it a reality show you're also put in this house for 13 days um or 14 days they take away your phone um you know i can't bring my dogs or my bulgarian brute of a husband <laughs> who can you know fight for me <laughs> so without that i was just i get nervous you know and i get i do get really bad anxieties at times and so i was nervous and a little afraid but i decided to not let fear dictate my life so i I jumped into it. So let me ask you this. So when they call and they say, hey, we want C.J. Perry as a part of the surreal life, you say yes. Is your next question like, okay, well, who else is on the show? Yes. Okay, and then how do we think of the names? Because there's some real, That's, there's some names on this show. Like, they're big names on oh, this show. Oh, yeah, huge names. Oh, my God, are you kidding me? That was literally my second question. <laughs> like, you're you're doing play-by-play -play of how everything went down. Um, <laughs> I was like, wait, who's on the show? And they're like, they wouldn't tell me. They wouldn't know. My manager didn't know. And then I was trying to be like a CIA agent or a KGB spy. And I was kept on every or the showrunner um, or the execs. I was trying to ask, like, these, you know, questions to try to put the puzzle together. Nope. They were like, we see what you're doing. I'm like, ha ha. <laughs> so I found out when I walked into the house. Oh, my I God. Did yeah. Dennis Rodman was there. I'm like, holy moly. Dennis Rodman. I couldn't believe it. I was such a fan of him and Chicago Bulls as a kid. And also his time with Hulk Hogan when he was tagging with him in WCW. So I was really excited. I was like he's kind of like a wrestler too. <laughs> so right. you automatically look for the wrestling people, right? Being from that world. Like I, I, I started my uh, radio show with Booker T, uh, you know, WWE hall of famer, Booker T. And you know, when, oh, whenever Booker T. books, the he's best a legend, he's the best. Oh my God. I, I love him. I do a spinner Rooney when I wrestle because of him. <laughs> right. I remember the Lana Rooney. It was, it, yeah, <laughs> he loved it. He loved it. Oh um, my God. He's amazing. Yeah. But so you always try to find the wrestling person, right? You're like, yes. Oh, Okay, he's the wrestling guy. I can talk to him. Okay, so we totally. like Dennis I, Rodman. Yes, and I think also like just um, athletes, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's any form of like, it could be basketball or ballet or um, wrestling. There's this thing about being super disciplined with your body and mind that we connect with. So that was like a connection, but also, you know, it's Dennis Rodman. So I was like, oh my God, what could happen? Um, and then Tamar Braxton was already there and she's just so funny and such a sweetheart. She's Tony Braxton's sister and 10 seasons of reality hit shows, singer. She won celebrity big brother. So, you know, she knows, she knows reality TV. Um, she's, she's an OG in that space. Um, and then Manny MUA was there and he, I'm a big fan of him because I watch his um, YouTube channel. 
So I was so excited. I was like, yay, Manny. Um, and then we just were there as other people keep on coming in every couple hours. Um, Frankie Muniz was next. Then Kim Coles from Living Single. Frankie Muniz is Malcolm in the Middle, just FYI. Absolutely. And Agent Cody Banks. How could we forget? Exactly. <laughs> um, and then who? Oh, then Stormy Daniels comes in. Stormy wow. was great. She's highly entertaining. She came in with Susan, who some people claim is a Chucky doll, but really it's, um, you know, Susan is, I don't know how to explain Susan. She's a doll that sees things. So there's that. Yep. She helps us all get rid of the bad spirits in the room. So that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can definitely use it. I mean, it was such a cast of characters. I mean, of course you said you, you, you bonded, I think with Dennis Rodman, um, but like who, oh, who August. was, August was oh, there August too. August Alcina. Yes, of yeah, course. I, that. I don't say his last name right. That's awful. But August is a, like great. I got along with August and ta- with everyone. Yeah. But I definitely had a like a connection. Um, I guess we should have named our car something, but um, Tamar was my roommate. So I, I definitely really connected to her and she's just so inspiring and very, you know, she, she talked a lot about mental health, um, just bringing awareness about it. I know it's people, I think we get scared about talking about it or don't want to admit that we, if we struggle with certain things and it's okay to normalize it, you know, it's okay to have discussions about it. And she was so inspiring in that, in that way and really inspired and encouraged me to go on, you know, how can I be as healthy as possible? And that includes in making, concentrating and bringing attention and awareness to my mind and my mental health as well. All of us. You know, we shouldn't be like scared of that word. <laughs> so she was great. Um, and then um, August and Dennis, we all four of us with Tamar would ride in the car every single day for hours to go to our activation. So we bonded too. Let for me better ask, for, for better or for worse. Um, let me yeah. ask though, like shooting the show. Um, when cameras are on, coming from your acting background, being a WWE, you know, obviously how to turn the character on work, work, right. And work the audience, work the camera, whatever. Um, how much of that is in the surreal life? Are we seeing the, the volume turned up to 11 on everybody or are these like very intimate moments? Oh, it's so interesting watching it back because, um, the cameras were on 24 seven. So you're there for 14 days and in every room there's cameras, there's sound and bathroom, there's ca- um, cameras and sound um, everywhere. And yeah, on top of it. So that's just in general. So they're always going to catch it on top of it. You have camera men, a couple of them and the, and the mics in the rooms running around. <laughs> Anytime you have a conversation, they're like in your face filming. You're like, Oh God. Can I just tell a secret for five seconds? Um, no, but no secrets. <laughs> it could make national television, global television. So, you know, that's was, that part's, you know, you, you know what you're signing up for, but it's like, oh my God, I can't even pee in silence <laughs> without the mic here. Know, that's like kind of next level right there. That's, that's maybe a step too far. Yeah, it's, it's it was a lot, but you know, it's got, now like I think about it, and I just like literally crack up. Um, but there was um, it's interesting watching it back because there's I believe six episodes, and to me, I feel like I'm watching a highlight reel. I feel like I'm watching an Instagram reel. I feel like it's like when I go on a trip and I take all these pictures and take all the you know video, and then I edit it down to seven seconds and post it on Instagram reels. It's such, it's like just the quick little highlights. And that's how like watching it back, I'm like, oh my God, there was so much more we filmed that and that's, it's just, you know, they, they, the network has chosen to go with um, making it faster paced, comedy, lighthearted. There was definitely a lot more drama than (laughs) what what it shows, but you know, it's hopefully everyone's entertained by it and it's good television and it's, you know, makes people laugh because that's was all of our goal. Let me ask you this. Uh, people obviously know C.J. Perry. C.J. Perry.com is where you can uh, join her brand army. Um, when we talk about WWE for just a second, um, what you came in as a, an actor and a dancer, if, if memory serves me correct. That was your background. Going into WWE, um, it's, a, it's a one-take kind of atmosphere, right? There's no, there's no business like professional wrestling. I think it's the ultimate show business boot camp. Because you have to remember lines, you have to hit your cues, and you have one take to do it. 
for a television audience and a live audience. What did you learn from WWE that you still bring to all the other projects you're involved with today? Oh gosh, that's such a great question. And you're, you, you know everything about it. I love that. I love the description you gave. Um, I, I think, gosh, I, I, I miss WWE so much because of how you just described it. Because there's nothing in the world like re- professional wrestling. And at the highest level of such a global franchise of being in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people. And on top of it, it to be live television and you know, huge social media following and reach. It's just there's there. It's such a merge of all these worlds. And a lot of companies don't have that. A lot of acting company, like acting shows don't even have that or studios. Even a lot of them don't have that type of social media reach like the WWE has plus, you know, it being live television, plus it being, um, you know, live television, plus it being like live people there, performance. Like there's not, there's just nothing in it that way. You know, you a lot of times have either social media people who are very heavily on the social media side and they're not in the traditional space or you have people in the traditional space that are not as um, on the social media side. So that's where I really enjoyed that. It was all these, it was television in the traditional space. It was in front of a live audience a live crowd when it comes to being a dancer and performing live. Of course, I love that. As an actor, I love the scripted part and the television part. And then as a creator, I love the social media part because we were able to, on our own social accounts, kind of blur the line. They encourage that. They encourage really driving the story and the narrative that we were putting on on screen on Fox and USA. And then blur it on the social media side so it was like this this place where you could kind of create a lot and I learned so much I learned so much about branding I learned so much about telling stories the power of social media so I'm very I I mean that's the best university I could have ever asked for now after WWE you also got to do a movie of Bruce Willis I mean who I love Bruce Willis uh talk to me about the uh the, the film and kind of that whole experience Oh, that was a blast. I mean, working with any legends like Bruce Willis or The Rock, John Cena, it's just, I'm so extremely grateful for these opportunities. Bruce is, especially now that he's retired, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm beyond thankful to have that experience and to be in a movie with him. Um, he was very, he was very kind to me and very nice and seeing him act you just immediately you're like oh that's why you're a movie star you know he's he just I guess when they say some people just have that it quality I often think it's charisma um and I I do believe we can all cultivate it but he it's interesting to compare him to let's say The Rock or John Cena where their charisma would come out on the microphone and it would be lo- like louder and project more while his charisma was very soft spoken and very like, it, it, but still there. And it was just like, whoa, you're still so captivating even though you're whispering. So it was, it was interesting. And you know, what a legend. Again, this real life Mondays, nine, eight central on VH1. Last question for you. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, let you talk about your brand army where you can reach out to the people, your fans. You have all kinds of content out there. You actually, I think recently with one of my good friends, we have another mutual friend in common, uh, Jen Sturger, my girl, Jen, yeah. love her. Um, love her. Talk to me about uh, the brand army. What can people find on there and how can they subscribe and all that? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, subscribe to cjperry.com. Um, I'm having a blast. I create content, everything from vlogging to, um, you know, just posted a bunch of Halloween stuff to me and Jen just did a collaboration, an FSU cowgirl collaboration. <laughs> so that's how we met was at FSU and um, being FSU cowgirls. So yesterday we did a real cute FSU cowgirl throwback and so we're both going to be posting it on our on our account so subscribe and um yeah i do mukbangs where i i will eat and tell stories from anything from wrestling stories to movie stories with bruce willis um anything is um, i answer all my dms i'm able to interact with the fans um and just to get to know people on a person more personal level 
but also be able to put higher quality content out. Man, it's so awesome. You know what, CJ? I wish you nothing but the most success in the world. Uh, again, the surreal life goes down Mondays on VH1, 9, 8 Central. CJBarrier.com is where you can find out more about her. CJ, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also the the thing about what on cjperry.com that is great is that I'm going to be telling all the stories that were not told on Surreal Life. So there's that too. You can get the behind the, the scenes drama. The tea will be spilt on cjperry.com. We appreciate you for yes. joining us on the show. Oh, thank you so much. It was so nice talking to you. Thank you. Broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world, and around the world, TV host, best-selling author, and radio personality, Brad Gilmore, brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Great introduction. Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripa. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is, is the, the collection. collection. Now your host, The, the Boat. boat. Brad Gilmore. And he joins us right now. We're talking about Pawn Stars Do America. It's going to be premiering tonight on the History Channel 9 Central Time here in the Texas Time Zone. The the Pawn Stars patriarch himself, Rick Harrison, joins us. Rick, how are we doing? I'm doing wonderful. Look at the dream. Yeah, man, I hear that. So, you know, Pawn Stars, Do America, the, you know, the trailer's been out there online. Y'all are making stops all around the 50 states trying to find, you know, the next great treasure. What was the experience like? Um, no, it was actually really fun. I mean, we, um, what happened was, like, we did season 19, uh, wrapped in April, and we're thinking, like, okay, we got to do something epic for season 20. And, um we came up with a bunch of ideas, then we said, like, you know what, let's just do, like, a whole different, like, series. And we did, so it's eight two-hour shows um, uh, all across the country. And um, we, at first we were calling it uh, the Pawn Stars Road Show, and then we were thinking, like, you know what, we got to come up with a better name than that. And then we came up with Pawn Stars to America. You know, like, I do work with Beavis and Butthead. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, uh, you do. That is a real-life <laughs> thing. Uh, <laughs> um so, like, like when you're when you're filming this season, you're going all across the country. What what was there a particular stop that sticks out to you that we're going to see um, during the seasons? You know, play out during these episodes. Every 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 time was great. I mean, I absolutely loved Austin because you know I just loved the music, and uh, uh, so I was out like listening to live music every night, and then dragging myself into work in the morning. <laughs> 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 Austin's a great town. Austin's a great town. But, you know, do you, so like when you're going on these things, I mean, wh where where are you finding the best items? Are you going to like, do you do antiquing? Does Rick Harrison antique all the time? Is that something that you do? I actually do that because, you know, I, I, I love to drive. I drive across, you know, like I have a ranch in Oregon, so I'll just drive there and I take different routes all the time. I'll just stop at antique shops. But at, um, on the show, though, I mean, we, we set up a venue and like uh, we advertised and like, you know, Hundreds of people would show up uh, in lines with all their uh, weird stuff, and I had a whole staff from the pawn shop there, and uh, that was how that worked. So I mean, people were just bringing it to me. But then you know, there's a lot of stuff. You know, people are coming to the show, and so I got this at my house. I can't get it down here. I go down and see it, maybe. Right. So that that way, you know, people, pe everybody, because I'm sure there's been so many people who watched the show for all these years. Y'all been on, you know, now for over ten years on the air and 20 seasons. I mean, it's incredible. And I'm sure there's people watching at home saying, Oh man, I have this great collectible that I just got to get in front of the pawn stores. And this kind of gives them that opportunity, right? Uh, it gives them that opportunity. So like, like I said, hundreds of people are showing up and we, we bought over a thousand items of, at, at, well, at the eight cities. Were in. And the funny thing was, I mean, like what you don't see on TV is like 90% of people show up with these great family antiques. Um, aren't worth a lot or anything all, most of the time. <laughs> is it hard for you to have to, uh, I guess, break, you know, break the news to them? Well, I, 
mean, yeah, they show up at a baseball, you know, signed by Babe Ruth. And I'm going like, well, the thing is, you know, uh, this thing signed with a ballpoint pen. And when Babe Ruth, Ruth was around, they didn't have ballpoint pen, so it's fake. <laughs> Well, my grandpa gave it to me, but your grandpa tried to impress you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, speaking of uh, speaking of baseball, I, I did have a question for you. It's a little Houston centric, of course. The Houston Astros just won the World Series um, here last week, and uh, it was a big deal. Now, the 2017 series was obviously the one with the cheating scandal. I just am curious, does a scandal like that attached to a World Series, does that raise the price of memorabilia if they have a championship ring or something significant from the series, or does it not, or does it have the opposite effect? Does it devalue it? Okay, well, here's one of the crazy things about the Houston Astros, okay? I mean, just about any uh, World Series rings you can buy and sell. They give you the ring, it's your ring, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want. The Houston Astros made everyone sign a document saying that if they ever decided to sell their uh, World Series ring, that, you know, they have to sell it back to, to the club. So that turns into sort of a nightmare with Houston Astro, Astros uh, World Series rigs. Um, so that, that's a terrible thing with that. But, like, no, the, it all depends on the scandal. I mean, there was a little bit of whatever going on there. That, that really didn't affect it. If it's, you know... I mean, there was uh, one person who wanted to uh, there was a, um, a Super Bowl ring uh, that someone offered to sell me once. And, like, the player um, got convicted of some very, very bad things. And one like, dude, no one's going to want this. They're not going to show it to your kid. Isn't this cool? Yeah, the player, though, was convicted of this, this, and this. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't The general really, cheating really scandal, I don't think, really affects the value. I mean, if you have a player that does something really bad, you know, I mean, like O.J. Simpson stuff. I mean, but it's just, usually guys collect this stuff. That, you know, they do it with their kids and things like that. You don't want – who wants something O.J. Simpson But they, you know, oh, this is O.J. Simpson. He was such a great football player, but he killed his wife. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, doesn't really help <laughs> the value there. It doesn't really help the value. Um, so let me ask you this, though. When you, when you go in and you buy something like a, a, a copy of the Declaration of Independence, which you, which you bought on one of the shows for, I believe, $1.45 if research is right – um, when you make an offer like that for that incredible amount of money, do you already in your head say, I know seven people who are going to offer me at least that on the, or I know seven people I can call to make a profit on that immediately. Or how do you, how do you come to grips with spending that uh, kind of money? Usually when I'm spending that kind of much money, I already have it sold. Right. So you already had that yeah, declaration. Uh, sold. Yeah. I mean, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, because I mean, like if, when it, when it comes to, I mean, almost everything you see on the show, they literally, the first time I see it is when they throw it in front of me. Um, you know, but sometimes things like that, you know, they know I would get really pissed off. They just flop that in front of me. And we're like, hey, you know what? I'm just not going to, you know, four minutes come up with a decision here. So, like, those really big items that let me know about uh, ahead of time. And I start making a lot of phone calls and um, have a lot of, you know, get a lot of research done. And then, um, I call up uh, a few um, gazillionaire customers and start getting, hey, won't we pay for this? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just incredible that you, that you – I'm sure that the network that you have of collectors is, is off the charts. What do you think, though, Rick, has made this show so successful? Because there's been a lot of people who try to do a similar show to y'all. There's been some moderately successful ones on History Channel, you know, ones that I enjoyed, like American Restoration or Counting Cars. None of them have the longevity that Pawn None Stars have. have. Why do you think that is? Well, for, I mean, one of the first reasons why is because I'm a family show. I mean, I, I told them from day one, I would never film a TV show. I'd be embarrassed for my mother to watch. It's always a family show, always going to be a family show. There's no super drama or anything like that. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of these other shows on other networks, and these people have no idea what they're talking about. It's, it's, it's baffling that they don't fact check them. But, uh, you know, the, maybe the show's different every time. You know what I mean? It's not like you got a motorcycle show. There's only so many things you can do to a motorcycle before it begins to get boring, and you're going to use all this crazy family drama. Um, with me, I mean, the show is de you definitely have no idea what you're going to see when you when you turn on the show. I film it so you can turn it turn the show on in the middle of it, okay, and still enjoy it. It's comfort TV, and um, I uh, like I said, I, I pounded in a coin chum every day. Like today is going to be the best show you've ever filmed. Every single day. I mean, there's always give it 110% and um, make a good product and uh, it continues to sell. I mean, um, I mean, I've done over 600 episodes of television. 
It's incredible. It's incredible. People would only dream to do that. Uh, in, in, you know, if in, in their television careers have 600 episodes, 20 seasons, Pawn Stars Do America debuts tonight at 9 Central. Rick Harrison, thanks so much for joining us this morning and continued success uh, for Pawn Stars for you. Thank you very much. All right, bye bye. Broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world, and around the world, TV host, best selling author, and radio personality Brad Gilmore brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> Great introduction. Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripa. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is The Collection. collection. Now your host, The the Boat. Boat. Brad Gilmore. And she joins me right now. This is the host of the ninth annual reality television awards that goes down November the 17th on Out TV, monstersandcritic.com. And of course, in the metaverse, Real Mood TV. Uh, you can catch it at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 Eastern Time. This woman is Hollywood royalty. She's been in the biggest blockbusters of all time, a house. Hold name. Welcome to the show, the incomparable Vivica A. Fox. Wowzer, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Brad. Well, thank you for joining the show. First off, I look, we're going to talk about the reality television awards. I'm excited to talk about this to you because I love reality TV probably mm-hmm. more than I should admit. However, <laughs> how does it feel to own the name Vivica? And what I mean by that is whenever anyone says that name, you immediately have to say a fox after it. You know, you've entered to the share conversation or the Madonna conversation. You own Vivica. How does that how does that feel? Gosh, it means that all of the hard work that I've done over the years has paid off. I have a, a good friend of mine by the name of Eva Marcel. She's like, girl, you're like a whole sentence. Vivica, a fox. OK, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, you've had a career that anybody getting into this industry entertainment would dream of. I mean, a part of classics that went the world around, sold hundreds of millions of dollars in box office sales, and also classics that people hold near and dear to their heart, uh, whether that's a set it off or, I mean, so many in your, yeah. in your pantheon. How does it feel when you're looking at your career right now? Cause you still have more to go, obviously, but when you look at what you've been able to accomplish, uh, it's gotta be a, a dream fulfilled. Well, it's rewarding. That's for sure. Like you said, I, I've, I've got, films that are always part of like, you know, something special, like soul food coming up for Thanksgiving. We're all about to celebrate Thanksgiving. And it's like soul food, you can always count on it to play. Uh, Fourth of July, you can always count on Independence Day playing, set it off. You know, people just love that. I got people walking up to me, Frankie gonna blow up the bank. Uh. (laughs) So, um, and then they send me TikTok videos, you know, doing my doing my characters from my movies. And so it's a huge honor. Um, for a moment, though, I have to say, when people started walking up to me or putting legend, at first I was kind of like, wait a minute, y'all. I still got some more to go. Uh, but it is a huge compliment. And so I just thank everyone that I'm still here and still able to do what I love to do. Let's talk about hosting the reality television awards. Again, that goes yes. down November the 17th on out TV, monsters and critic.com and in the metaverse, real mood TV. Yes. When you're hosting. Okay. Like what, is, what is our thought process here? Are we going to, are we going to kind of roast the crowd? Are we looking for comedy? Are we going to keep it light and, and, and fluffy? Like what, are, what are you, where are you going with it right now? It's a little bit of all of those things, to be very honest with you. That's the beauty of, of hosting. And and uh, the American Reality Television Awards are called The Artists. And like you said, they're going to be on um, November 17th. Uh, you're going to get some comedy. You're going to be surprised how funny your girl Vivica can be sometimes. I think people forget that, you know, I can do comedy as well. I do a couple of skits. Uh, I've, we've got this one skit to the deadliest catch that I kind of surprised myself that – 
you know, my comedy chops were still in there. So we did that. And then I also did another skit with Dr. Pill Popper that was lovely. Um, and then, you know, we have wonderful moments of saluting those that have made a huge contribution to um, the reality world. Uh, Tiffany, New York Pollard. Pollard, excuse me, is going to be inducted into the Alter Artist Hall of Fame. Oh, so wow. we're going to be hearing people. We're going to be roasting people. You're going to get to see your Viv, your girl Viv, do some skits. So it's going to be a fun show. And it's got tons of, 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 of great stars from the world of reality that you're going to see presenting as well, too. And then, like you said, they just showed me this thing that um, you can also watch it in the metaverse. So Viv is going to be in the metaverse as a DJ, um, you know, dance and get my groove on. So it was really <laughs> a fun experience. I love hosting. It's definitely a new chapter that has come into my life. Yeah, I mean, it especially when you have the the amount of colorful characters that you can have in the reality television world, there's a lot of uh, subject matter that we can uh, yeah. speak on <laughs> and, and have fun with. Um, but are, I mean, are you a consumer? Do you like the reality television? Are you a watcher? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? I, I never thought I would get sucked into the world of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. I never thought that that would happen to me. Uh, and, and I love checking out the housewives just to see what they're going to be wearing and the amount of cleavage that's going to be going on. Now, I'm going to let y'all know something so I can get y'all tuning in that I had to put my housewives cleavage on for y'all to tune in. So you'll you'll be very happy. But they've been asking me to be a housewife for, year, a housewife for year, years, and uh, I haven't given into that just yet. Yet. Just yet. You never know what's around the corner. You never uh, know what chapter may hit you. I mean, it's just amazing how reality TV has just totally taken over. I mean, some of the biggest stars that we have now is because reality television has allowed lots of folks to get um, exposure that they uh, that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. Yeah, you know, we were actually talking before uh, you and I started discussing. I was talking to one of the, the publicists for the show, and we you yeah. you had a you had something earlier. She said that was really interesting that the stars of reality television have kind of replaced the stars of the soap opera yes. in some ways. And I never considered that. But when you think about it, yeah, the biggest yeah. stars in the world, whether it be a Kim Kardashian on down, yes. now yes. are launched from the reality show. Yeah. And you know what? And, and I commend a lot of people try to hate on the Kardashians, but I commend them that they have taken their little show, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and have created a billion dollar franchise for almost each girl. Like yeah. each girl is clocking dollars. You know what I'm saying? They clock a dollars. They've got hair. They've got makeup. I mean, they. I just heard the other day that Kim's about to uh, uh, want to incorporate one of the kids' names. So, you know, oh. reality world has provided a lot of opportunities for um, individuals that just, it, it, it's it's like sky's the limit. It really is. Yeah, and Kim Kardashian now helping people get out of prison, doing all kinds of like great things in the world too, right? Absolutely. Off her platform. It's incredible. Yes. It really and is. then, you know, let's look at Cardi B. Cardi B started off, you know, did one, one season of Love and Hip Hop, and now she's like one of the biggest rap stars uh, in the world. So, you know, reality television did his things. I never thought I would see the day where we didn't have as many soap operas, and it's all about the housewives. Well, because you, you started in the soaps, right? Didn't that where some of your early ro yes. roles came from? Yes, I started off on um, Days of Our Lives. And then from there, I went to Generations, which was the first fully integrated soap opera. Then from there, Young and the Restless. And Young and the Restless, I was discovered by um, the producer's wife, who was at home, and they were having a hard time finding the character Jasmine to play alongside uh, Will Smith. And the producer's wife, Bill Fay, she was at home. She's like, I think I saw a girl today that you guys should check out because I couldn't get an audition at the time because I was just on Young and the Restless. And I remember asking because I played uh, uh, this date from hell with Will on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I was like, we're both tall. We'll match up great. And then finally, because the wife was at home and saw me, I got an opportunity to audition. Six auditions later, I was in the classic Independence Day. Well, can you can you then settle something for me about Independence Day? I've heard a sure. rumor, and, and I don't know if it's true or not, regarding your character. You went mm -hmm. through these auditions, you get cast, right. and I heard, like, if you didn't nail it on the first day, they had someone to replace you already? Right. You better you better have done your homework and research <laughs> on Biblical Fox. I love you for that. That is a true story. Wow. Uh, the At the premiere, the after party, we were sitting there having drinks, and the director was just 
tell him, you know, hey, we made it here, great premiere. And he said, Vivica, did you know if you weren't good after the first day of filming, we were going to fire you? I was like, no, I did not, but thank you for letting me know that. But he said what happened was that their first choice, at the time she was working on a television show and she was unavailable. And they said that she called, they called, her people called the first day and was like, hey, she's available. And they're like, we're filming our lead. I mean, Vivica Fox today. And they were like, okay, well, she sucks in the in the dailies. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll just recast, that's how much money they had. <laughs> <laughs> that they just could have wasted a whole day and started over again. Thank God they said you lit up the screen and they were like, nope, that's our Jasmine. It's it's incredible to hear that and, and to think of how different the movie could have been because you you and Will in that movie, perfectly cast is is how you could describe it. It just made so much sense. It was so I iconic and legendary and electrifying on the screen. So did you... You didn't have a, okay, you didn't think about this, but you did know this could be your big break, right? Like, I got to nail this. Absolutely. I, I remember, like I said, begging my agent to audition. And um, this movie, when it was going around Hollywood, that they were casting it was like the biggest thing out there. Independence Day started the trend of must-see popcorn summer blockbusters. We were the first movie. We made $800 million worldwide. I mean... Yes. Okay. I hate to break out them receipts, but you know, it was there for me. Uh, <laughs> Going to make me sweat my yeah. perm out with that number. Got yeah. 800 million. 800 wow. million worldwide. And I remember I was in Toronto at the time filming my critically acclaimed movie, Booty Call. And uh, it was sold out around the clock, 24 hours. Like you couldn't get a ticket because we were going to go see it. I was filming with Jamie Foxx, Tommy right. Davis, and Tamala Jones. And it was sold out around the clock. Incredible. I mean, incredible. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. I don't mean to put you, uh, this isn't me putting you on the spot, but I just want to give like a comparison between two iconic people that you worked with, that you okay. have intimate experience with, because you talk about your comedy chops that you're going to show off here uh, at the Reality TV Awards. Again, going down November the 17th. Make sure you go check it out on Out TV, MonstersOfCritic.com, in the metaverse, Real Mood TV. You work with one of the greatest comedic minds of all time, Larry David, on yes. Curb Your Enthusiasm, which your season, uh, where, where your cast of characters, you come in with JB and everybody uh, in Curb, is the best season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's the funniest. It lasts so – it's so great. I, I go back and I watch it all the time. Um, what was that experience like? Because on Curb, for people who don't know, there's not a script script. There's an outline of what you're, what the scene's about, and you know where A is, you know where B is, but you got to kind of make it up on the way there. Was that a challenge for you as an actress? Absolutely. Are you kidding? You're 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 your own writer, producer, and director. And let me tell you something about LD, Larry David. He is brutal. He will look at you and go, that ain't funny. No, no, no. Come on up with something else. And you have to put on your big girl boots and not take it personal. Um, but no, there's never a script. You walk in and there's basically what we would call in show business a synopsis. So it'll come in like the family today. Uh, decided to use recycled toilet paper instead of Charmin. Create a scene. So he walks in and was like, yo, so like, what's up? Um, y'all, y'all bringing in some other kind of toilet paper. And we just go from there. And JB Smooth was awesome to work with. So oh, it just made you put on your big girl boots and, and, uh, and use your comedy skills. Cause things you, you may think are funny. All right. As I well, was <laughs> I was going to ask, though, how does he compare with because I think Larry David's such a creative genius. When you look at what yeah. he did with Seinfeld and Curb Your Enthusiasm to be that funny for that long, people don't realize Curb's been on since 2000 and it's still going on. That's 22 year run. You don't hear about that. Another icon from the 90s who continues to put out high quality uh, material is Quentin Tarantino, who you got to yes. work with in two films, Kill Bill one and two. Right. Both guys are known for their idiosyncrasies. Uh, can you compare the two of them? Did they work similarly or was Quentin a little more hands off, more hands on? No, Quentin was very hands on. Are you kidding? We trained for six months 
uh, to to do that fight scene. I mean, I literally went from like a size eight ten down to two because it's all we did was work out. I was like, are we training for the damn Olympics? Was tap. Uh, but it was great when I saw myself on camera on screen. I had a special booty light. Um, <laughs> I read about this. You had a booty light just I had for a you. Booty light. He says, "Listen, I've got Vivica Fox from Booty Call, and 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 I didn't work hard to keep keep that booty tight and right. Absolutely, Vivica, come on through here, and we gonna." Twice, I had two great booty lights. When I went into the front room and the little girl and the bus came in, and then when I kicked her through the door, uh, the great kick through the door, if you go back and look at that and put it in slow-mo, my booty is vicious. It's like that. <laughs> I love it. But, you know, he loves his words, too. Quentin yes. loves his words, whereas Larry, you can you you improv the words. Uh, Quentin didn't let you improv, right? No. I mean, it's literally like working with two different genres. I mean, because... Quentin, uh, he's very descriptive when he writes. Um, like, okay, like say this, the, I'll make this quick. Uh, Uma walks into the room after she stabbed me and walks across the cereal that spilled on, that I tried to shoot her through the kaboom box. And you can hear the crackling, crack, crack, crack. She wipes her knife. You feel the thing go across it he describes every single moment so with ld you get a synopsis you 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 don't have to come up and fill in the blanks but but improving for you is not something that that you're foreign to because in the f gary gray film set it off didn't you improv one of the great lines from the movie is this true you improv it off off the cuff i'm strict i'm strictly dickly (laughs) Was that an improv? You didn't think I would say that, did you? I didn't know if you'd go for it. I didn't. I didn't want to put it out there. But if you wanted to say it, you yeah. Was that was that an improv? Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> he loved it. Oh, and then there was another one that I did when I said uh, you didn't ask me if I was thirsty, sister. I came up with that. But you know, we 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 really worked as a family when we did set it off. To be honest with you, because the movie um, changed a lot. F. Gary Gray, hats off to him. Like I said, I've been so fortunate to work, like you said, some of the most amazing directors and co-stars. F. Gary Gray, he said, I will not have people come and see Set It Off and think it's a comedy. I want them to walk out and be moved to know the motivation as to why these four women decided to rob banks and mission accomplished. But I've worked with the best of the best. Well, again, you can see all these talents on display November the 17th at the Reality Television Awards. Again, OutTV, MonstersAndCritic.com. And of course, In the Metaverse, which is another crazy thing that you can see this on, In the Metaverse, Real Mood TV, where you can see the avatar of Vivica A. Fox. Um, Vivica, it's just been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. And uh, I I won't say Hollywood, uh, I won't say legend anymore, but I'll say Hollywood royalty. How does that sound? Yes, darlings, check out your girl Vivica A. Fox hosting The Artist, November 17th on Out TV. Check it out. Broadcasting live from Houston, Texas, and around the world, and around the world, TV host, best selling author, and radio personality Brad Gilmore brings you a collection of conversations with stars from movies. Mark Wahlberg. Hey, how are you? The legendary Mr. Christopher Lloyd. Christopher, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Great <laughs> introduction. Television. Jimmy Fallon joins us this morning. Jimmy, how you doing, my friend? Good morning. Thank you so much, Brad, for having me. I appreciate this, bud. Kelly Ripper. Brad, thank you for having me. Comedy. Jay Leno joins us. Jay, how you doing? Hey, Brad, what's going on? Gabriel Fluffy Iglesias. Good morning. Music. Lola Monroe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Grammy Award winner Maya joins us. How are you? And more. And more. This is The Collection. collection. Now your host, The the Boat, Brad Gilmore. And he joins us right now. You know him from the stage and screen. According to IMDb, this man has over 153 credits to his name. He's going to be lending his talents to the special Pickled, which debuts on November the 17th at 8 Central on CBS. He is the legendary comedian, John Michael Higgins. John, how are we doing this morning? Uh, very well, Brad. Nice to be with you. Um, it's uh, already sunny out here in L.A., and I'm, I'm two, two hours behind you, I think. So. <laughs> well, you know what? Early to bed, early to rise. Makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise is what my grandmother always yeah. said. Um, hey, man, let's talk about this special. Well, pit- one of the three is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
No, I'm sorry. I just interrupt you with a bad joke. <laughs> That's what I do with my wife all the time. Um, when we when we're talking about pickled, this is a uh, this is a special talking. This is a pickleball tournament. Tell the people exactly what pickled is. Well, pickled is a celebrity tournament, sort of like in the, in the old days we used to do, you know, uh, Battle of the Network Stars, that sort of thing. Uh, and um, we haven't done that in a while in this culture. We that all turned it all turned in sort of gladiatorial things of like you know professional athletes going off and you know climbing walls and things. But Stephen Colbert had this idea. He has a big charity, Comic Relief, and. Just like the idea of uh, celebrities aren't good at doing real things; they're great at doing fake things. And pickleball is like almost a fake sport. But real pickleball players actually are serious athletes, as it turns out. I had no idea. I thought the whole thing was a joke. And it, it turns out pickleball is a real thing. You know, it's like a real industry, and people are really good at it. Um, and as it turns out, surprisingly. A lot of these celebrities are really good at it. I'm not sure how they found them. <laughs> but like, no one asked me if I was good at pickleball. They just told me to come in and do jokes. But I actually forgot to do jokes after a while because I was so enthralled by the sporting event. I, was, I couldn't believe how exciting it was. <laughs> and some of these players are just on fire. I'm going to drop a name here, which, uh, which is Emma Watson, who was uh, you know, in Harry Potter and everything. What a what an athlete and just just she was tearing it up. She I, it was a pleasure to watch her. Her partner was Sugar Ray Leonard of all people, and he was fantastic. You know he's he's been uh, one of the great athletes of our time for many years. You know, and uh, the two of them, young and old, were just like what a team. That was really exciting to watch. Yeah, you you don't realize like when you hear pickleball. The name, it sounds like a perfect sport to make a comedy theme special around, as Pickle is going to be. But you're right. People take it so seriously. And there's professional leagues. Teams now are selling. I was talking to Melissa Rivers the other day, and she said that she tried to buy a team, but it's just priced out of the market. They're going for seven, eight figures for a, for a pickleball team. <laughs> and it's like, I didn't even I didn't even know this was real. Did you try Did you try to play pickleball during the, the filming of this, or have you picked it up afterward? <laughs> Well, you know, I picked up a paddle at one point, you know, during a break, and just to see, you know, how hard is this? And it's not difficult to do the basic thing, hit the ball over the thing. It's a light ball, small paddle, small court. But really, it's it's actually, I thought it was more akin to basketball, mostly because the amount of the athletic um, requirements of, like, constantly switching directions, quick changes, because it's a miniaturized court, so it's, like, very compact, but you have to move constantly, and you have to move in thousands of directions constantly. And that's why, like, I could never play because I'd rip my ankles to shreds. I'm 60 years old, you know. But th that's what happens. Bold men can't play basketball, and they can't play pickleball either, strangely, because it, it's, like, it's it replace shuffleboard as, like, the go-to senior sport. I don't get it. <laughs> I think it's dangerous for the seniors. Uh, again, Pickled is uh, debuting November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pickled is debuting November 17th at 8 Central on uh, CBS. John Michael Higgins is doing the commentary. So how do, how do we approach the commentary? You said you were there for jokes, but you said you really started to get into it. And were you calling the play-by-play? -play? Were you doing color? Yeah. What? I was sort of uh, doing courtside stuff, you know, interviewing players as they came off, you know, uh, as they're breathing heavily and just sort of making jokes about them and making jokes about pickleball. Quickly, That quickly dried up because I was so impressed with their playing. I was like, how in the world did you do that shot? And they're like, oh, I got lucky, you know, and I just I was really impressed. I was stunned. I said, boy, I don't even belong here. These people, these people are serious. So um, it was really fun, though. Steven was super funny. And, you know, we had Kenny Loggins doing the, you know, national anthem, and we had, you know, it was just a great event. It's such good television. I think your your listeners will love it. It's I think it's on November 17th, so check it out, please. Yes, November 17th on CBS at 8 Central Time, Pickled, the special hosted by Stephen Colbert. Uh, Will Ferrell's going to be there, uh, Luis Garzman, Tig Notaro, Bill Rafferty, Emma Watson, as you mentioned before, Sugar Ray Leonard, and, of course, John Michael Higgins is doing the, the uh, court side interviews um you know man in everything that you've been in and i mean this seriously i've always laughed 
every time you've been on the screen, I've always enjoyed your performance. I was going down kind of a John Michael Higgins rabbit hole last night on YouTube, and I don't remember who it was. One of your cast members uh, on some project you worked on said that you're a script elevator. Whatever's on the page, John's going to make it that much better. Um, I'm sure that's a great compliment to hear. Um, but but what is your approach when you take this? Because you have an improv background. You're a theater guy as well. Um, why do you think that you, you're able to elevate a script as, as you were described? Well, uh, that's all very nice. Thank you for those lovely compliments. I appreciate it. Uh, but I've been an actor my whole life since I was a little child, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I guess uh, the real answer is it's never about jokes. It's never about what's funny. It's about the story. And if you buckle, if you just dig into the story and the story is well done, it will be funny or it will be sad, whatever it needs to be. But you just can't get distracted by your own fantasticness. You can't be, you can't be your own audience. You have to be a player in the drama or you got nothing and the audience hates you. If you, if, if you step out and you say, Oh, this, this profile is better than that profile. And you start thinking about that. You're dead. You're not going to be funny and you're not going to be sad. You're just going to be a loser. So that's, <laughs> that was, uh, that's my, uh, that's my advice for young actors out there. Story, 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 nothing else. Story is what matters. It's, it's what puts the uh, sells the tickets, right? Puts people in the audience. Um, I, I only have a little bit of time left with you. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. And I don't know if you love this film that you're a part of or what your feelings are on it, but I'm a massive fan of the Bill Carter books in my studio here. I have pictures of David Letterman, Jay Leno, and, of course, Johnny Carson. Love late-night television. You're a part of The Late Shift, which is a... A, a, a movie that I actually, I actually love. I don't know how you feel about it. What do you remember about working on The Late Shift? Well, I'm a big fan of Bill Carter, too. And Bill Carter had an unusual gig there because uh, he was the journalist who wrote the story for The New York Times but, and, and the book. Uh, but he was also writing the screenplay. So that they, I don't know why they allowed him to do that, but I, I thank my lucky stars that they did because he wrote a great screenplay. And it was a pleasure to do because he just writes so well. And the story, again, goes back to my previous answer, was so strong, you know, the way he lays the story out. And uh, really, all I had to do was, uh, you know, it's tricky playing a person who's a real famous person, uh, particularly if they're alive. You know, playing Teddy Roosevelt is one thing, but playing David Letterman was just two channels away from me, if you're, you know. <laughs> You could flip back and forth to see how I'm doing, to see how my A vowel is doing, you know. And it's tricky to do that. And it was difficult, I have to say. It, more difficult, it was a more difficult job as a media circus. The response to the show, the way Letterman responded, the way Lennon responded, the way all these people in the movie were real people. And they all had things to say. So we had to deal with that. I had to deal with a lot of it. But the actual shooting of it was incredibly fun and difficult, but fun. And uh, I, it was, a, it was a, a great gift to have such a great part. Uh, yeah, I love that movie. And I, and I love being able to talk to you this morning. John Michael Higgins, uh, again, it's pickled going down November the 17th, 8 Central on CBS. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, John. My pleasure. Anytime.